Hey everyone, welcome back to DIY Biotech. Today we're doing an exciting growth experiment with a yeast named Gerald that I isolated from a water kefir that I'm brewing. All right, here's the yeast right here. You can see the little colonies there that look like little constellations. And then down here, there's more dense colonies. And if you wanna learn how to do stuff like this, you can go back in the a Bioengineer Makes Kombucha series. I'll show you how to pour the agar plates and then isolate individual organisms from whatever fermented beverage or food product that you have. So essentially what I did is I took a little bit of a sample from Gerald and I grew him in several different tubes and different media just to sort of see what would happen. So I'm sort of calling this a growth characterization. It's a little sloppy, but I think it will give us a really good idea of what this yeast can do. So towards the end of the video, I'll give these all a sniff and a taste test, as well as find their alcohol content and their pH. So this is the sort of characterization that I'm doing. If it smells and it tastes good and maybe it produces a little bit of alcohol, I could scale it up and make some sort of beverage with the yeast. But for now, let's leave it into the hands of past Nick to tell us how we got here. What we're trying to do today is use this single organism that I've isolated from the water kefir that I've been brewing and try to brew something with just the single organism. And I'm gonna brew it in comparison to the regular water kefir. So essentially what we'll have is one kefir grown with just yeast and another kefir grown with the whole consortium of things. The second thing that I wanna to try today possibly more interesting is actually making bread with this yeast. So I'm going to sterilize some water and flour mixture and inoculate it with this yeast and see if we get any activity. And if we do, I'll use it sort of like a sourdough starter. Sourdough actually contains some bacteria from what I understand. So it'll be sort of interesting to see just one organism in sort of a sourdough. I don't know what you would call it or, or what it's going to taste like, but hopefully something interesting happens. So what I've got today to get started is a little bit of brown sugar. Brown sugar is important because it contains molasses. If you use just white sugar, there probably won't be enough nutrients for the yeast to grow. Uh, it's, it's harder for organisms to grow on plain sugar. So the, the molasses and the brown sugar sort of add nutrients that the yeast need, particularly nitrogen from what I understand. We also, of course, have our alcohol lamp right here, our alcohol spray bottle to clean our work surface, and these sterile Chinesium 50 milliliter self-sanding centrifuge tubes. <laughs> you don't have to use these exact tubes. You don't have to use tubes at all if you want to do something like this. You can just use some sort of container. These are just sort of convenient. Uh, they're, they're just very easy to work with. So what I'm gonna do is add 50 milliliters of water, and then I'm gonna add 10 grams of sugar. That's about the ratio that I use to make my kefir. Uh, I'm actually gonna add the sugar first just to make sure I don't overfill or, or anything like that. I'm gonna do these samples in what's called a biological duplicate. So typically it's good to do triplicates, so three of each test that you're trying to do, but I don't want to use that many materials, so we're just going to do duplicate. We're going to do two tubes that just have this water kefir yeast, and then two tubes I'm going to put one kefir grain each with, so inoculate it with one kefir grain each. And then I'm going to do a couple of tubes with a little bit of flour and water mixture uh, and inoculate that as well. And the way I'm going to sterilize these after I prepare the tubes is I'm just going to throw them in the microwave for, you know, a few minutes, maybe four or five minutes in an effort to sterilize them. This is potentially not the best way to sterilize the tubes, but I don't have a pressure cooker, at least not yet. So, okay, enough talking. I'm actually going to do some things. Ah, uh, my math. I should be using a quarter of that, two and a half grams. We're using two, <laughs> two and a half grams per 50 milliliters. Okay, I'm also going to use a, a, about five grams of flour. So that's flour in that tube. Okay, nailed that. I'm, I'm also putting in some brown sugar into the flour mix. So I'm using a small amount of flour 
so that I don't end up accidentally making some sort of shoe pastry. And I'm using some of the brown sugar for the yeast to be happy. And the flour is in there for the purpose of getting the yeast adjusted to the nutrient source. So I've talked about this before in a, in a previous video, but organisms sort of take some time to get used to a new environment. Uh, oftentimes, this is what's called the lag phase, or at least it's a component of the lag phase in microbial growth. So when you, when you start a new culture of growing some organisms, it, it takes them a minute to start growing. And then all of a sudden they start growing exponentially and then they sort of reach the limits of their vessel size and the nutrients available and it sort of tapers off. Uh, and that's called the, the stationary phase, I believe. But yeah, you have a lag, exponential, and then a stationary phase. Sometimes that's broken down a little bit more. But anyway, the genes of the microorganisms sort of work as light switches and dimmer switches, and it, it, it's, it's all magic as, as far as we're concerned. But essentially, the organisms need the nutrient source to get adjusted to. So when I transfer this to a larger pot of flour to actually make the bread, if everything works properly, then they'll be used to the flour and it won't take them as long to get adjusted to the new source. So I'm pretty sure this yeast is gonna be happy on brown sugar because that's what it normally grows on. And I'm sort of transitioning it to the flour, sort of like getting <laughs> getting a junkie off of drugs. Uh, you know, we gotta slowly transition them or uh, they might not live. Okay, so I've been microwaving these. I put them in a little Tupperware because I knew they would overboil. This one lost like almost two thirds of its volume. So that's nice. It's sort of a nasty paste. Maybe should have used less flour. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I've also managed to somehow mess up this Petri dish. I think it froze in the back of my fridge. It got too cold back there. You can still sort of see right here a streak. Uh, you know, ideally, you would you would be taking individual colonies to inoculate each of the thingers, but this is going to be messy. And, and since I've messed up this petri dish so badly, and these little organisms are so near and dear to my heart, I'm going to restreak them. So I, I have a new antibiotic plate here. I'm going to shut up when I open the petri dish. But I've got my, you know, everything's been sprayed down with alcohol, including my hands and the inoculation loop. Uh, everything should be sterile. So uh, I'm going to take the most precious streak, which is to propagate the organism. Uh, and I'm actually going to streak plate properly this time and sterilize the loop between each zigzag. If you've seen the episode three of A Bioengineer Makes Kombucha, you'll know all about the zigzags. Okay, uh, I don't know if you could tell, that was an absolute mess. We'll, we'll see what this does in the next two or three days. That's going to go in the 30 degree C refrigerator incubator. All right, so the single yeast are done. You notice I, I shut up while I have Petri dishes and these tubes open. That's not just for your viewing pleasure, uh, but it, it's also to prevent me breathing contamination onto the samples. The other thing that I did is I made sure to let these cool down. These are a little bit warmer than body temperature, maybe about body temperature now, so you know maybe around 37 degrees Celsius. Yeast can survive at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, 30 degrees Celsius is ideal for yeast. 
All right, so here's the kefir that I've been brewing. So instead of taking a single kefir grain, I'm gonna use these sterile pipettes that came with the Petri dishes that I ordered. And just take, you know, a milliliter per tube. Now we wait. I'm gonna leave the caps loosened and put them in the fridge incubator. To the incubator with you. I'm actually heating it with this heating pad here that's used for seedlings, for plant seedlings. Uh, and it's been working really well. All right, it's been uh, two days now. Look at this. Single colonies. See, that's how you're supposed to do this. So Gerald, as he's been called, is doing well. Uh, yeah, it's been two days. That looks really good. I'm happy about that. Um, this is the control. So this is the kefir. Um, and you can see there's stuff floating around in there. Actually, that's carbonation. That is fermenting well. The other one's doing well uh, also. This is the single yeast. So yeah, no carbonation in there. We're still gonna get, let that go for at, at least another day. All right, so this is now the third day that these have been growing. So this is the, the water kefir here. Uh, so this is basically the control sample. And you can see that the solution has a cloudiness to it. If I invert it a bit, oh God, it's leaking everywhere. You can see there's actually carbonation. So, uh, you know, this is just kefir. There's nothing crazy here. This is our control. This is the whole consortium of organisms rather than just our yeast named Gerald. So here is one of our single yeast colonies. You can see it also has some cloudiness. In laboratory settings, this is called optical density. The lack of light passing through it is the optical density or OD and a higher OD or optical density usually means there's more cells in the solution. So, you know, originally it was clear, now it's cloudy. It probably has organisms growing in it. So unfortunately there's no carbonation in this sample. Gerald is disappointing me a little bit, but it could have just been because the container was open and so it wasn't, you know, carbonating itself. All the CO2 was allowed to escape. Not really sure there. The flour, water, and sugar sample is pretty gross looking. Uh, it's, it's really hard to tell what's going on since it's so viscous, but let's give it a smell and a taste test. And I think that will tell us what's actually going on. So first we have the kefir here. So I know what this tastes like. And if it tastes normal, then this is probably not contaminated. It smells like kefir. Water kefir is just, is so good. If you haven't brewed water kefir before, it's delicious. It brews twice as fast as kombucha in it, and it tastes twice as good too. Yeah, uh, that's kefir. It's sweet. It's got a little bit of carbonation, a tiny bit of acidity. It's really nice. So now we have our single yeast. Let's give it a sniff. It's got a little bit of like a bready smell. Uh, yeah, I, this one's interesting. Let me compare it. I'm gonna compare it to the other single yeast sample. Yeah, they, they smell the same. They actually smell really similar to the Cluveromyces lactis brew that I made a little while ago. I'll, I'll put the card up there to that video. But basically I made a Cluveromyces lactis fermented beverage from the whey from the cheese making process. So it was basically an organism that can break down lactose and use it as a carbon source. So anyway, this has a really similar smell to that Cluveromyces lactis strain. And in fact, I'm pretty sure what I remember from my research is there is a Cluveromyces species that's commonly found in kefir. So potentially we have a Cluveromyces species here, not really sure, but let's give it a taste. I guess I'll taste this one. I'm being chicken. It, it tastes like there's a lot of sugar still left in it. It really tastes like it hasn't broken down 
very much of the sugar, to be honest. The smell is definitely there. We also inoculated this with a really small amount. So I might throw a couple of the samples back in the, in the incubator, in the fridge incubator, uh, to let them go a little bit longer because this doesn't taste like much is going on. So for the last sample, the, the flour goo, I'm just gonna smell it. I'm not gonna taste this. I don't wanna drink raw flour. It smells just like the other two samples that I just sniffed, except it has a flower smell to it. So I'm gonna let these incubate a little bit longer and see what happens with them. But I'm still gonna test the alcohol content and the pH now. If there's alcohol in these single yeast samples, I think that's a really good indicator that something is going on. Okay, first we're gonna test the pH real quick with the little pH test strips. So this one is going into the regular water kefir. Uh, so maybe a, a, a four and a half. We'll give it a four and a half. How about that? This one is going into Gerald's. <laughs> this one is going into Gerald. So that's a nothing going on there. Okay, so to find the alcohol content, I'm gonna be using this little alcohol detector. I make these for brewers. I really don't think anybody who watches this video is gonna to want to buy one of these, but like the company's rare combinations if you wanna look into them and, and see how they work. But uh, essentially, it has a little sensor inside that reads the alcohol vapor coming off of the sample. And it's important that all of the samples are at the same temperature. So. I'm gonna use this in a really rough way. I'm just going to measure a 0.1% alcohol standard and a 0.5% alcohol standard, and then see where our unknowns lie in this range. This first sample is a 0.1% alcohol solution. You can see it bubbling away in there. So we don't need to worry about the, the built-in calibration here. We're just gonna be looking at this raw number here. So our temperature is about 21 and a half degrees Celsius. Our raw reading is about 375, 376. Okay, we'll say 380. 380 is pretty good. Next, I'm going to read our half a percent sample. So you can see there's more numbers, so there's more alcohol. Okay, so this one is also about 21 and a half degrees Celsius, and we're looking at about 620 on the raw reading. So our bounds are 380 and 620, between 0.1 and half a percent. The, the first sample that we're gonna test is this water kefir. So our water kefir, this is just a home brewed water kefir. Again, the temperature is about 21 and a half degrees, so that means it's in calibration since our calibration standards were at about the same temperature. 735, 736, around there for the water kefir. I would hazard a guess that this is, you know, around 0 0.7, 0 0.8% alcohol content. So once the reading falls a little bit, then we can test our Gerald sample. Okay, so as you can see, the reading has fallen a decent amount. So we're gonna go ahead and screw in our sample of Gerald the yeast. So there's almost no alcohol in this. At least we can pretty confidently say that there's less than 0.1% alcohol in this. So let's screw in a sample of water and see what happens. So you can see the reading is much lower. So Gerald's got more alcohol in them than water, but still less than 0.1%. So we're gonna let the fermentation keep going. I think something is happening. I will follow up with this video with an epilogue of what happened to Gerald. 